So let me begin by giving you a bit of a background on how do we perceive uh, 3D. Uh, our eyes are like cameras, uh, and a camera takes an image, which is a 2D projection of a three-dimensional world. Uh, but inferring the 3D structure from the 2D images that we take is very central to perception, uh, both to human perception and machine perception, which just tries to mimic human perception. Okay. Uh, so all we are seeing are two-dimensional uh, projections of this world, uh, but from that we seamlessly are able to infer the 3D structure of this world. Okay. Uh, so how do we do that? What are the uh, some of the cues that go into inferring that 3D structure? And the process is not 100% completely understood of how it happens in human mind, uh, but there are a lot of things that we do understand. For example, uh, that we have two eyes, uh, and that helps us uh, look at the world from slightly different viewpoints. Um, so if I'm looking at the tip of this pointer here, uh, the image of this tip in my left eye and in my right eye uh, is formed at a slightly different location, right? And what is that difference is a function of how far away this thing is. Uh, so if this was very far away, uh, then that disparity would be low. Uh, if it was very close, then that disparity would be high, as this figure shows you. And so uh, if you have more than one camera, uh, you look at the scene from slightly different angles and you can construct 3D. Uh, and that has been exploited successfully in machines. Uh, for example, the Mars Polar Landers, uh, uh, the Odyssey and Spirit Landers, uh, which were designed to work for three months. They, are, they have been working for more than six years uh, and still uh, moving around Mars, and they look at their immediate uh, sort of uh, front, and they are able to construct that in three dimensions uh, so that um, they can avoid boulders and stuff. Uh, so that's why they have two cameras up on this mast uh, that's doing a stereo computation. Uh, but there are other things that you can do with a single camera also. Uh, so for example, perspective in a single image is an important cue uh, to help us understand 3D. Stereo, by the way, works reasonably only for a few meters. Uh, I can't do stereo disparity resolution for things as far away as the end of the room there uh, because uh, the disparity between those things is very low compared to my width of the eyes here, the distance between the eyes here, which we call baseline in stereo. Uh, but there are lots of other things to help me understand 3D. Uh, so for example, uh, this line here helps me understand uh, that uh, there is a there's a depth we, we perceive these lines to be really parallel in the world, but I'm seeing them at an angle, and that's a function of depth. And therefore, I can infer depth from that, uh, or some, some part of depth. Uh, no, depth, of, uh, the, uh, depth as in this car, the relative size of this car and that car. How close is this car compared to that car? And, and this line helps me understand that. And in fact, in this particular case, it's an optical illusion because while most people will realize by looking at this picture that this is a smaller vehicle, this is a larger vehicle uh, by inferring, but they wouldn't probably realize how small the actual size is. Uh, so this vehicle was actually this size. And the trick here was that these two lines are really not parallel in the world. We think they are parallel, but they are actually forming a triangle, therefore enhancing the depth perception, uh, I mean distorting our depth perception. So it's just an optical illusion in this image highlighting how perspective helps us understand uh, depth also. So if you see railway tracks, let's say you're standing in the middle of railway tracks, you take an image, the tracks sort of meet in your image, and that tells you something about how far away things are, uh, where they meet are, uh, is further away, where they are uh, far apart is closer to you, and so on. Because we understand parallel lines and so on in the images. You perceive it. This, this is, in reality, not a straight strip, but a triangle. And that fools you into thinking that this car is bigger than what it actually is. Had this been a straight line like the median line in the middle of a road, uh, your uh, perception of the size of this car would have been different. So, so, so you don't expect from this image that the car is actually this small, but it actually is. Uh, uh, just highlighting that perspective plays a role. Uh, similarly, shading also plays a role. From a single image, you can infer the 3D structure of the image 
just by looking at the shading of the pixels. And here in this image, all cues other than shading have been removed. Uh, but we can still look at this image. It's a 2D image, but understand uh, the 3D structure from it. Okay. Uh, here, uh, shading is also playing a role in in understanding what this image is. But in addition to shading, another cue is helping, which is occlusion. Uh, so what is in front of which we think that these are rectangles, and therefore partial rectangles are there partially because they are behind other things. Uh, so to illustrate occlusion, for example, if I show you this structure uh, and I ask you what the 3D shape of this is, there are at least uh, an answer. A question like that always has infinite answers, but there are two that are clearly uh, understandable from here. Uh, one, that it could be a cube. Uh, and the other that it's a hexagon with uh, diagonals connected, right? So one can perceive both of these uh, with equal ease. Uh, but if the image was like this, then you can't get the he hexagon hypothesis correct in your mind. So then you understand that it's it has to be a cube. Uh, so occlusion relationships also play a role in how we perceive 3D. Uh, similarly, texture is also an important cue. In these images, um, I see a circle, but then I see ellipses. Uh, but in my mind, I perceive that the ellipses are also really circles. They, I see them as ellipses only because they are tilted. And because of that, I infer 3D. It could very well be that this structure is entirely flat, and that's a painting. Uh, in fact, that is what it is on this screen. Uh, but you perceive it to be a 3D structure, uh, and that's because of the cue that texture is giving you. So there are a number of things that uh, that allow you to perceive 3D. Uh, one that I have not talked about yet, but that is what my talk will be about, is motion. Uh, so motion is a very important cue that also helps you uh, understand 3D. So for example, I show you a few of these points, and I ask you what is the 3D structure here. Um, any ideas? These are two people fighting. Uh, and, and with some sense, you can perhaps, some people can see it better, some people can see it as, uh, as better. But exactly the nature at which, I mean, how they are fighting uh, becomes uh, more visible if, if you uh, perceive this as a video. Oh, I'm, actually, that's not how it was supposed to play. Um, Let me play it outside of. Uh, OK, so uh, let me play it again. Uh, in this uh, movie, there is uh, the only information available to you is motion. You, you are not seeing anything else. Uh, but, but through that motion, now you are able to understand the 3D structure much more precisely. Uh, uh, of of the action that happens, and therefore, if if I were to pause on the last frame of the movie, uh, which is actually this frame, uh, uh, if you do this carefully, you will be able to understand, for example, that this dot here does not belong to this person; it actually is the kick of that person. Uh, that you can tell now if you see the history uh, of the movie. Um, so um, somehow the display is not coming out well here, but um, uh, these moving dots let you in your mind connect th those dots together. And then you are able to understand some structure from it. In fact, in visual perception, this was a very famous paper, uh, which is called the Johansson's Moving Light Display Experiment, uh, done in 1973, uh, where uh, this researcher uh, took people in a dark room and put bulbs on their limbs, on their joints, and made movies and then showed those movies to other people. So it's just a pitch black image with lights moving and asked people what is the action, what is happening. And humans were able to infer an amazing amount of information from those movies. And that's where the importance of motion in uh, visual perception was highlighted, because all other cues like texture and shading and uh, stereo were taken away. Uh, in fact, Johansson has a theory which is accept, uh, accepted in visual perception uh, that says that the 3D structure of, of displays like this when they are moving can be understood just by these moving points after you recognize the object. So, so he proposes, uh, the way this process works in brain, he proposes a two-step theory. You first recognize that this is a person, and then based on that recognition, you are able to infer the 3D. 
and that's an important subtle point because I'll come back to that uh, towards the end of this talk. Okay, so with that background on perception, uh, let's talk about uh, the structure for motion problem. And I'm first going to talk about a simpler case of that problem, which is called the rigid structure for motion problem. Uh, this is uh, not work done by me, just to be clear. Uh, our work is on the non-rigid structure for motion problem. But to understand that, we'll first look at this uh, problem. Um, images have, uh, in, in videos, uh, videos are just stacks of images. And videos can have motion because of two different reasons. You can have a video that has motion because the camera is static, but the objects are moving. So there is motion in this video, right? Um, people are moving, cars are moving. Um, there, there's a whole structure to the scene that you can understand. And, and this, all of the motion in this video is purely due to the object motion. Uh, in contrast, all of the motion in this video um, is purely due to the camera motion. So there is no object motion in the scene. Uh, but, but if I look in the image, points are still moving, right? And those points are moving just because the camera was moving, OK? Um, so this problem is what we'll talk about first, which we call the rigid structure for motion problem. From this motion, I want to infer. So let's say I've given this video as input. I want to infer the 3D of the scene. Uh, but uh, I, I know that there has been no independent object motion in the scene. So if there is any motion, that must come through the camera. Okay? So that is the assumption in uh, rigid structure for motion. And this problem is very well solved. So uh, this is a 3D reconstruction of the scene. Uh, there is a point cloud. Uh, we are showing it as, again as a movie because, because we don't have a 3D display. Uh, but that's the structure that is inferred uh, from, the, from the scene. Uh, as you can see, uh, it's, a, it's a fairly good reconstruction uh, of, of the scene. Uh, a lot of points in the video were taken. Uh, they were marked through the video by a tracking process in 2D. And then from that 2D, this 3D structure was inferred. One 3D structure that came out of that movie. And it's one 3D structure because I know the structure was not changing itself. So it's the same structure over the entire uh, sequence. This method is uh, the results that I showed you are from uh, uh, a famous paper, a seminal paper in the area, which is the Tomasi and Canada paper in 1992. Uh, so let me explain the basic crux of how this works. Um, and this is also motivation to learn linear algebra later, because uh, there is a, it's a very simple approach, but just based on a simple linear al algebra trick. So what you have is, as uh, to understand there is some 3D structure in the world that exists in the world. Now I'm going to image it uh, from my camera. So let's denote the 3D structure, which is unknown to us, but it does exist in the world as a matrix, which is x1, y1, z1, the coordinates of the first 3D point, x2, y2, z2, coordinates of the second 3D point, dot, 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 xp, yp, zp, which are coordinates of the last point. So there are p points. And the entire structure that I want to infer can be represented as a 3 by p matrix. Okay, uh, So that is what we are after. We want to find that. But what we have as input are images. So let's say of this scene, I have image 1, image 2, and image f. Uh, as input, we will assume, and, and that that's, will become clear how that works. But we assume that some, some points are marked in this image. Uh, which are also marked in this image. So I know that point number one here in image one went to this point in image two. So I have an entire track of points. That's a 2D problem, no 3D involved, but I but I have the tracking of points available. And there are also automatic methods to do that, like like the results that I'm showing you are, are generated completely automatically. But that's a separate problem, and therefore I won't concentrate on that. That's called the tracking problem. OK, so this input is written up in a matrix form again. So this the, the, the actual images are input, but to the algorithm, you, you, you give a matrix as input. So let me explain this matrix, because this is pretty critical. What you do is all the image observations that you have, you put them into an image observation matrix. And the way this works is that all the points of the first image are written as the first two rows, x1, y1, x2, y2, x3, y3, all the p points. So there are p points in f frames. And so you write those p points in the first two rows for the first frame. 
the, yeah, this is a 2D image observation matrix. What I'm observing after the images, the points that I was showing you in that karate movie, I'm just writing them in a matrix. Yeah. Yes. So tracking is done. So so therefore x1 y1 and x2 y2 are aligned. Okay. So tracking is done, but tracking is a 2D process, not a 3D process. Okay. So once tracking is done and I am able to come up with an image observation matrix, the question is from this, how can I infer that? Yeah. Yeah. How many points you were seeing in 3D are, are here? So, so yeah, a simplifying assumption that there is no occlusion uh, happening, but yeah, there can be, there are methods that extend this idea to occlusion also. Yes, the camera is moving around this tree. Uh, it's actually exactly the same video that I showed you. Uh, the data is coming from exactly the, yes, yes, but they correspond through the image tree. It moves somewhere, but I have to find its coordinates. So, so let me explain. So, so th there are p points here in the 2D, and I've written them in this these first two rows. Then there are p points in this image. They have moved somewhere else, right? Those p points have moved somewhere else because there was some motion, and that motion is entirely due to the camera. Uh, all of those I write here. By alignment, I mean that the same 3D point generated this and this, okay? So, so it's not that they are shuffled up. Uh, I'll, I'll show you figure. So there are P points here and all of them are written here. So this matrix will have uh, two F rows. F is the number of frames because every frame is generating two rows of the matrix and it will have P columns. Each row pair is data coming from a single image. Each column is data coming from a single 3D point. Right? So this column represents the 3D point tha, wo is image mein kahan pe tha, is pe kahan pe tha, or is pe kahan pe tha. Right? And that is written up in this column. Okay? So this is the input to your problem. That we call this the image observation matrix. Very important to understand because I'll be talking about this matrix throughout the talk. Okay? Uh, and from this, the question is, uh, somebody gave me this, just this, nothing else. So somebody gave me this matrix. I want to tell from these image observations what's the 3D structure. Okay. So how do we go about doing that? The the anticlimax is that the technique is extremely simple. It's it looks like a difficult problem to do, but it's not. I mean, ten lines of MATLAB code really, you can do it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. No, so this is a point, it moves, in the image it moves, in 3D it hasn't moved, but in the image it moves, it's the same point. So a column is the same point tracked through the F frames. Well, that's the tracking problem. I'm, I'm assuming that's done, given to us, okay? Maybe somebody marked them manually, but there are automatic methods also to do that problem. Yeah. Uh, no, it's not necessary. I'll show you an example where they are not. Uh, so the images do not have to be temporally sort of consistent with each other. In fact, their temporal ordering does not matter here. Okay, so how, how, how do we solve this? We take this matrix and the key observation Tomasi and Kanade came up with was that this matrix has a low rank. Now, for those who don't know what is rank, I have to sort of somewhat apologize. Uh, but that's one of the things you'll learn in linear algebra. The rank of a matrix is the number of independent columns that it has. Uh, a, a rank 3 matrix means that the columns of this matrix exist as points in a three-dimensional space. Uh, uh, so they were the first ones to realize that under certain simplifying assumptions about the camera model, uh, it doesn't work for every camera, but under certain simplifying assumptions about the camera model, uh, the matrix is not full rank. It's a severely restricted matrix. Uh, and why is that? That's because this W matrix, which is the image matrix, can be written as a string of camera matrices multiplied by this structure. The camera matrices are matrices which have the ability to take projection to convert 3D to 2D. Okay? That's just a mathematical structure. So I have F camera matrices, each of actually size 2 by 3, uh, and they multiply with these uh, structure. This S is exactly the same as this S uh, to generate this matrix. 
and since this has three columns and this has three rows, therefore the rank of this is three. Okay, and they exploited this rank constraint uh, through uh, through just linear algebra for for those graduate students. I mean, they did singular value decomposition of W and uh, put certain constraints on that, uh, and they were able to exactly reconstruct. Uh, exactly separate out, I mean factor this matrix out into an S and an R. Uh, so not only do they get the structure, they also get where was the camera when each image was taken. Both are, it, it's sort of a factorization problem, right? Like like you have a number, you say what are the factors, just say multiply, okay, but and under certain constraints, they sure okay, that can be done uh, in a very, very simple way. Uh, so uh, camera can be, camera is an equation, camera is not really. Camera is a, no, a camera is represented as a equation which projects from 3D to 2D. So it's a mathematical operation. Uh, S is the structure. S is my representation of the structure. Uh, let, me, let me sort of in a simple way uh, uh, explain it like this. This matrix contains the entire motion of the sequence. When we said motion is two components, motion is how much camera moved and how much object moved. In this case, the object did not move, so the object has just one structure. But these encodes, where was the camera at each time? And that is generating, I mean, when you multiply these out together, you get exactly this W. Uh, I'll come to that. That's the real interesting problem, <laughs> right? Um, so uh, while this uh, video is not from exactly that method, but I mean, things have improved. There are other ideas in the field and so on. Uh, but this is a demo of what can be done uh, these days in rigid structure for motion. Um, here the camera is moving around this object and then completely automatically they sort of track the points using texture in the images. They track the points in the video and from those they generate the 3D point cloud and also the positions of the camera. So this is a 3D point cloud of points that were tracked on that Medusa head uh, which is a uh, ancient sort of thing in I think Greece or I don't know where. Uh, but uh, the, the cameras are generated by these cones. Uh, it doesn't, uh, you might not be able to perceive that the structure is correct or not, but if I sort of uh, shade it um, through maybe just the Lonny triangulation, for example, um, we'll see that this is the extracted structure, right? We, we've triangulated the points and given them a shading. Uh, and so you see that the extracted structure is pretty good uh, and done completely automatically. Um, and in fact, it looks even better if we texture map it, with, let's say, with the first image. What was the texture of the first image? We put on top of this image, uh, as we will show just now. Um, so this is a completely now synthetic movie, right? Taken the first image, put on the 3D structure, and then camera rotating around it. So, so you can see that the structure reconstruction is very, very good, OK? Um, so uh, in terms of a perceptual sense, why were we able to do this? Like I said in stereo, when you look at the world from two different viewpoints, you can infer depth. A moving camera is sort of like stereo because it takes images of the scene from different viewpoints. The scene is not changing and therefore it's like I took a lot of pictures of the scene and from that I'm able to infer the structure. Uh, 3D location of every point, that structure. Uh, so uh, a, a really interesting demo of uh, this technology. I mean, this has become now really mature. The, the the sign of maturity is that now this is available on the web. You can go take uh, go to a tourist place, take a lot of pictures, uh, submit them to this website. Uh, it just came up this year, photosynth.com. Uh, you can uh, you can take a, a picture of some something, submit your images, and it will sort of put them into 3D. Uh, uh, so these are pictures. Actually, somebody submitted a, a, a data set from Multan. Uh, anybody from Multan here? Yeah? No? Okay. <laughs> I, 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 uh, I've heard that this is a really beautiful Shah Rukh Ne Alam Ki tomb. So from this, what you are able to construct is a 3D point cloud of the tomb structure automatically completely. And uh, all the images themselves are also registered. Uh, by registered, I mean we understand where each image was taken in relation to other images. And what that allows you is to build sort of a 3D mosaic of your entire data set. Uh, it doesn't look as impressive on this slide, but uh, uh, but if you look on, so, so for example, this is one photograph. It was one picture, uh, but it's registered in the larger picture also because multiple pictures of each point were taken. Uh, this data set contains about 150 pictures. Uh, so 
I can jump from picture to picture because I understand the 3D structure. Uh, uh, so, so that's to answer your question. Do they have to be temporally synch synchronous? No. I mean, this was not really a video. These were multiple images, but they behave like video taken at different times, right? Uh, so I can jump from image to image. Um, all of them are sort of registered with each other on 3D. Um, Yeah, this is completely automatic, 100%. You submit your images to a website, it returns you this uh, thing. In fact, uh, you can uh, look at the uh, 3D point cloud. Um, so that's the underlying point cloud that is inferred from those images. Okay. Uh, so all of tracking and, and all the sub problems are done completely automatically here. And, and the polygons here show you where each image was taken. So it's a it's a it's a mature technology now. I mean, uh, uh, but but one should recognize that from the first paper, first substantial paper that came out in 1992. I mean, there were lots of papers before that. Uh, to a real workable solution, took more than 15 years. Uh, uh, this became available just re recently. Okay. So with that as the first part of the talk, I will now talk about our sort of contribution, uh, which is in a in a more harder problem, and that problem is called non-rigid structure. And, and as you may be able to infer from the name, the problem is that what if while I'm taking the video, the scene was also deforming. It's not a rigid scene, but it's a non-rigid scene. Uh, so the motivation for that comes from typical videos that we see on the, let's say, that we see on YouTube or internet. Uh, I mean, these videos are very, very unstructured compared to the three video that I was showing you. Uh, and they are bad quality, and the scene is lighting is very different. And and is it even possible to reconstruct the 3D structure from a video like this? Uh, and that's a goal that has not been achieved because these are these are videos that are of uh, very high complexity. But I'll show you some steps that have been achieved. So remember, uh, so to set up the problem, remember that I set up the rigid structure as a single. Right, just to re-emphasize, every column here is one point. It's three coordinates of one 3D point. Uh, so this represents a rigid structure. The structure is not going to change over time. As soon as you go to non-rigid structure, uh, so this is what you wanted to infer from your data as as the answer, as the output. Uh, when you go to non-rigid structure, uh, like let's say this uh, dance sequence here, uh, that's an example of a non-rigid structure. As you will be taking the video, let's say a camera was moving around this object. As you will be taking the video, the uh, the structure also is deforming. Okay, so it becomes a pretty hard problem. Why? Because every point moves in the image, but you don't know. It could have moved through camera motion, or it could have moved through its own independent motion. So now the factorization becomes much more difficult. Okay, to see what portion was structure and what portion was camera. So a structure like this, I can write as a set of repeated structure matrices. So the structure at time one is like this matrix, a three by p matrix. The structure at time two is another three by p matrix. Dot dot dot. The structure at time f is another three by p matrix. So the entire non-rigid structure is now written as a much larger matrix, a three f by p three because there are three dimensions. So it's three times the number of frames uh, and p points. Okay. So whereas in the previous problem I had to estimate this, in this new problem I have to estimate this. Uh, so you can see there is a drastic increase in the number of unknowns that you have to estimate. Yeah. <clears throat> the origin does not matter. The origin does not matter. It's arbitrary. So the reconstruction will be up to an arbitrary origin. So that does not matter. It, uh, no. I mean, there's some 3D origin uh, with which these points are. I, I don't know the points anyway. So I can uh, imagine any origin. And against that, the points will be reconstructed. Yeah. But, but, but it's in the details. We can talk about that. But actually, it turns out in this formulation, it does not matter. Okay. Both the image origin as well as the world origin do, do not matter. They are arbitrary. Okay. So the structure at time one would would perhaps be this, and the structure at time two would be a different structure. Okay. And the structure at time 
uh, p would be yet another different structure. So that's how the uh, non rigid structure would look like. Uh, okay, so I can still write it as a similar equation as I wrote it earlier, except that the matrix sizes are now larger. The W matrix is exactly the same in, in its construction. It's a 2 F by P matrix, but the camera matrix grows in size substantially. Uh, and that has to do because now the camera, individual camera matrices, the small 2 by 3 matrices come along the diagonal here. That, that's how it has to be done. And the structure matrix also increases in size substantially because it is, it is this matrix. And that's what we want to find out from this. Okay. 